my speech is gonna be designing green WordPress websites. And first, a few words about me, only a few. Um, my name is Paulina Kiviranta. I am a service slash UX designer. I've worked as a designer for some seven and a half years, and I am currently working, well, also at Exove, <laughs> as Janne was. And um, I have a master's degree from the University of Tampere. But that's pretty much about me. Let's go into the actual topic of the day, which is how we can make WordPress websites more friendly to the environment without compromising UX and without compromising SEO, which can be concerns that if we start dabbling too much with this, sort of minimizing the Im environmental impact, then are these things going to suffer? And I promise you, they are not going to. And I'm hoping this talk will provide some food for thought for many different roles. Like this is not going to be uh, too tech heavy. I hope this is going to be good for designers, developers, content creators, and also other roles. For example, people who are working as clients or in selling websites or whatever. So, yeah. Well. I'm also not going to spend too much of my time with this sort of this why argument or the philosophy behind this. I am going to be pretty hands on on the how, but of course I'm going to sort of start very briefly with what it's about. And this is also kind of if you listened in the morning, similar things, but yeah, so as we heard in the morning, and I'm going to repeat it today, the ICT sector, it uses a large-ish percentage of the world's electricity and generates some 1.5 to 5 percent of all of the greenhouse emissions in the world currently. And if you were awake in the morning, you might have noticed that the numbers possibly were a little bit different, and that is because there really isn't a, I mean, the whole green gas emission thing, or even what is IT, ICT sector, they are kind of vague or like complex things. And it pretty much varies from study to study what the exact numbers will be, depending on how you are calculating things. But that does not, even if the numbers vary, that does not mean that the phenomena wouldn't be real or that it would be somewhat vague. It's the phenomena is very much real, even though there isn't some standardized measurement right now for how to measure everything. But yeah, it's somewhere four to five percent of the electricity, one one to five percent of the green gas house gas emissions. And this particular number came from um, the Euro Parliament's, what would you call it, some, some kind of an act or a question that they had, which was based on a study. I have the link right there. I can't remember the <laughs> specifics either, but yeah. Um, and the, then the second argument is that the, we have to remember, or we have to think that the d digital is not immaterial. Even though it might feel like it is like everything, it lives in the cloud and you can put everything in the cloud when you feel like it and it's nowhere and yeah. But digital isn't immaterial like in the most profound sense because every time a digital bit is changed, it changes its state or it is created, it is saved somewhere, it consumes electricity and every time it is stored somewhere, it is stored somewhere. It is in a data center physically somewhere. It's like the cloud is is still a tangible thing. It's not just a, I don't know, a magical <laughs> cloud somewhere. So yeah, digital is not immaterial. And um, with that thought, you have to also remember that the digital, while the digital revolution is is kind of it's changing some old 
ways old industries, maybe even making some old industries totally obsolete, that it doesn't automatically mean that the digital transformation is green and clean, because yeah, even even the digital consumes things, and how I like to, how kind of like to think about it is that, especially in the last few years, that when we have come up with the whole cloud thing and our hardware is really like it, it is capable of amazing things. Um, we have created a digital abundance like there is really the or the of course there is a limit but the technological limit is very very high like some I don't know maybe 20 years ago uh, there was the lim limits were so much smaller, like what can you do? Because it's just, you can't make websites very flashy because nobody's computer is going to run it. But these days you can do so much. We have the abundance and we don't really even need to worry about the, like uh, the sa space that we are using to s save things in because with the cloud, it all, all also feels like it's endless but yeah we have the abundance but now that we have the abundance i think it's time to start learning some digital responsibility because even though we have the abundance it doesn't mean that the stuff doesn't go anywhere or like like it's not consumption so yeah and that's it about the philosophy of it i am gonna go into the how part next um well, I'm going to approach this thing this way. First of all, like how we are going to measure and how we're going to think about the whole consumption thing. Um, you might have heard about the digital carbon footprint. And what is it? Um, well, uh, the carbon footprint, it's a metaphor for evaluating the environmental impact of insert here a thing, whatever thing, in this case, a digital thing, a website or a device or an application or whatever. Uh, so it's not an actual footprint, not an actual tangible thing, but it is a metaphor. Um, it's usually calculated so that it is the amount of greenhouse gases produced per an unit, for example, per a kilometer hour page load, whatever that is relevant to that inserted thing. Mm. And yeah, in the digital realm, the footprint is also it consists of many things. And we as developers and designers have an influence to some of those variables and also there are variables that we really maybe in our role cannot control but how I see it, that in our sort of development roles what we can have an effect on is the electricity consumption that is caused by a page load. The electricity consumption of the user's device of course we have maybe a little bit smaller influence on that but anyway and then the phys storage or the physical space that is required to store data that is collected and generated and by us and by our users and yeah as and as Janne in the morning he talked about maybe about these other variables as well and he talked about the hardware side of things and that and that's yeah, that's true, but maybe it's also something that we directly can't influence that much. But here we have these few things that we at least can influence. And yeah, well, how would we apply the digital carbon footprint? Mm, well, unfortunately, as you may have from a previous slide already figured out, there is not a sort of a gold standard for the footprint like like they're like it's really simple to for example measure like how much paulina weighs when she goes to, goes to a scale and it shows a certain kilogram and then another person can do the same and we can compare but 
for the digital footprint, there really isn't a similar gold standard. Like there are many different type ways to calculate it. And if you want to start kind of easy and you don't want to start coding your own calculators or anything like that, then there are numerous calculators already online. And I encourage you to explore them, check them out. Um, there I have, for example, there's the, well, the website Carbon that was mentioned earlier. And then there's this Globe Mallow, which is, I think it's a pr browser add-on or something. Mm. I encourage you to try. I encourage you to explore. But there are several little pitfalls that you should avoid when you use them because um, as you as you see the number that you are going to get from the calculator, it is an estimate based on different variables. Like I think actually Anne explained it earlier a little bit. Like like yeah, there's. It, it knows some things, it, some things are estimates, for example, the your location, and then it kind of estimates what kind of electricity you are using and how much carbon that electricity is making up. And it can even be so, we, some, at some, some time ago with a colleague, we tested some website with the Globe Mellow, and we actually tested, we were in the same room with similar laptops, we were in the same internet and we tested the same site and we got a different number because it's probably she had some kind of a VPN on or her location services off or something like that. So probably the calculator guessed that we are somewhere very different. Like, I don't know, maybe I was in Europe and she was in India or wherever. So even two people with very similar setup can get different numbers from a calculator. So when you're using one of these calculators, first of all, I think it's, you need to remember that it's, while it's useful, the number is also very arbitrary. Like it is not the sort of ultimate truth of how many grams of actual carbon dioxide you're site is going to produce. It's it's just some kind of a estimate. And you should take a minute to dig into what does the calculator actually do? Like where where does it get the number? What does it really do? And uh and then when you're using the number that you get, it's it's your uh, kind of if you if you think you are going to be Using that number, for example, you're gonna post it on your front page. Like, look at this. My my site only produces this much carbon. It's the same as growing one banana or something like that. Then please don't do that. That's like big, big stupid because you can't use that number like that because it's not really accurate. So, what you can use these calculators for? It's like for measuring positive change or negative change, why not? Like maybe ideally you will pick one calculator, then you'll check the baseline for your site, then we'll make some changes and then you'll do a recheck of what happened. But don't, don't use the numbers given by these calculators as some kind of definite truth because they definitely are not. And then the other concept, um, digital waste. What is that? Uh, that is very much in the core of all of this. So, you know, as I told you, digital content, it consumes energy and space. And it does so no matter how good or how useful the quality is of the thing that consumes energy. Like, if you have a site that has a component and a person loads the page, the same amount of energy is always going to be used despite of whether the person actually reads the content or whether they just skim past it. So, yeah. Um, and digital waste, how I would like to frame it is, for example, elements that 
the end user doesn't need that don't have a purpose for them or elements that maybe maybe are useful in some context but not in the current context that are in a wrong place um, data that is collected but not used elements that consume too much in comparison of how useful or how nice they actually are like that are just maybe good but also wasteful uh, then redundant content and content that is just created for the sake of content like whatever that could be and another thing that you want to think about is the energy intensity and while it's good to avoid waste altogether it's also and it's also even better to be mindful of how energy intense the components or blocks or elements that you are making are and as an example of energy intensity and not energy intensity for ex all, all those things like videos big photos and other multimedia i don't know it's probably a bit rare that you would have sound clips on your site but anyways mm, some really heavy script stuff special effects and embedded or integrated elements those are kind of intense and then some pretty plain stuff like text vector graphics links buttons dark colors uh, color areas lines stuff like that those are not very energy intense mm. and how do you avoid that waste is you should think user journeys and the user's needs mm. keep in mind what your user actually needs and design around what your user is doing and what they need and not around corporate needs for example that often comes around like yes we have to have this element on the front page because our this and this department says that it's important so it has to be right here even though it could be that users really don't need that or don't design content because of FOMO fear of missing out like hmm, I'm thinking between these two elements here I can't decide um well I'm gonna put both of those in so don't do that and you should what you should do is you should recognize who your users are and what they are on your site to do and then you should pick those relevant user journeys and make them as straightforward as possible because you want to avoid the extra page loads that would be on a very long journey to their goal and also when you are making those user journeys don't drizzle any irrelevant elements there on the path like this could be like there's some kind of a landing page in the middle of the journey and then you're like hmm I think I'm gonna put some I'm gonna advertise my blog posts here because the user could get interested of those but no that's not not the right time to sort of misdirect them to some other direction so keep the path straight and also quite concise and clean and also straightforward of course it doesn't mean that you should stack everything on the front page because when there's everything on the same page then no one finds anything anymore and well this is something that often happens when selling or selling website projects is that the client is going to be then like mm, uh, but yeah I, I don't really want that design stuff i just want the website please and but I think there I'm going to argue that there it really isn't a website that is too small for thinking user journeys because what how s small your website is there always is an intended user and there's always an intended purpose for that user whatever that is it could be as tiny little thing as just 
this guy wants to come to your site and find your contact information. And if you if there really isn't one, then there's really no reason for you to have the site altogether. But I don't think there is a site too small where you shouldn't think about the user journeys at all. And uh, this really, thinking about the user journeys doesn't have to be an ordeal. It doesn't have to be all that big. It, you, it could just be like you sit down for one hour and then you just write down who come, who are you waiting, expecting to come to your website and what are you expecting them to do. Or, of course, it's a, if it's a complex thing, then you can have a, have an entire design sprint or whatever, but but like, yeah. And there on the right is what you should think even when you're doing this mini, mini version of this. Who is your user? What do you want them to do? What steps are they taking? And how are you going to make this journey as short as possible? And now on the next slide, all of these, I guess, three last slides that I spoke through are going to be brought together in this <laughs> very beautiful graph of how are you then going to avoid the digital waste? You need to think of those two axles, like the energy intensity and the user need. And there is like four zones. And on the top left is the zone where you should not go into. It's where the a component or a block or anything is very energy intense, and it's also not really needed for anything. For example, I would think about like, at least some years back, it was really a popular thing to put a, a social media feed on your front page. And I agree there sometimes is a need for that, but quite often it's very much something else that people are going to do on your website. And if they want to follow you on social, they are going to go to the social media platform and follow you there. And even though people really don't want to see that component, it's going to be loaded for them every time they are visiting your front page. So don't do that. Then there's these uh, blocks that say, think about it twice. Maybe on the top, you should think about it in the sense that is there a way to make this a bit more efficient? And then on the bottom, it's more like, well, yeah, it's not such a burden, but um, do I really, really need it? Or maybe should we put it somewhere on a backlog? And then if we really start feeling like, yeah, we need it, then maybe pull it out again. But yeah. But then there's the bottom right corner and uh, that's pretty much good to go. It's low energy, it's high need, so yes, do that. That's what you're aiming at. And then, like, when you're thinking, whose responsibility is it anyways to make sure that websites are more green or they there is no digital waste produced or extra consumption? And I would like to argue that it is everyone's responsibility who are in some way dealing with the site in question. It's developers, but it's not just developer magic. It's also the designers who can especially think about the user journeys and and designers are especially good at thinking like what is needed and what is not needed. Mm. Then it's also the content creators, especially in, at least in the WordPress project that I've been doing, a lot of the stuff that we do, it's just tools for the content creators. And it's actually in the content creator's hands to make sure that they don't just fill it with massive stock photos or something like that. They are actually the ones who put the meaningful stuff in action. And then also in the top corner, the client, there are there's stuff to think about for the client because sometimes they don't like they have to make these decisions as well and that we are not going to be sort of organization oriented and we are going to prefer those user journeys and so on 
So it's pretty much everyone who has something to do with the site also is responsible. Mm, then I'm gonna run through, because I'm running out of time, I'm gonna run through this super quick. Um, I have a few words of like food for thought for each role. So when you're a developer, mm, I think some main thing that you can do is that you can get to know the components that you are working with. You can find lighter solutions and you can think, can you customize it to make it lighter? And also you are the expert of what is under the hood. So I think in a sense, it is your job to educate the designers or the content creators on, on this aspect, like, hey, hey, this is a very heavy component. Please, let's think about something else. Are you sure? And also some technical solutions that you could, that maybe other roles haven't thought about. For example, automatic image optimizations, lady lo lazy loading, caching, that stuff. Then designers. Well, there's the user journeys, findability, relevance, that stuff. And also thinking about what should be displayed on every page and what should be only displayed on a particular page where the user goes only if they want to see it. For example, my example for this would be like um, an embedded Google Maps thing. And someone may be thinking, it would be really nice to have it in the footer so people can see where our office is located. But really, don't put things like that in the footer or so, because it is, again, loaded every time, even for those who are not going to, uh, or who are not trying to find out where your office is located. Yeah. And also, don't design solutions that will drive the end users to create digital waste themselves. Like, like uh, this, this is a really, uh, this is a deep end, but my, the thing that, kind of or, uh, an application that really, really drives people to create digital waste is the camera app on the phone. You can <laughs> think about that. Mm. And then the look and feel. You, can th you should think about which components are more energy friendly and which ones aren't. So preferring vector graphics over photos, darker colors, Avoiding unnecessary eye candy that people don't even necessarily appreciate that much. And also some font stuff. Some are much more in energy intense because they are, the user needs to sort of load it when they come to your site. Those kind of things. Then content creators. Approachable structure. Thinking really ha hardly what is needed and what is not. And that's the hard part because uh, at least usually when I'm, I've been working in a website renewal project, then usually the story is that, yeah, our old website, it's so bad because there's so many pages and no one can find anything from there anymore. Yeah. So that would be lovely if people thought about that. Don't create redundancy. Only use photos and videos when they bring some additional value. So don't sprinkle these stupid stock photos where there's like people laughing with a coffee cup or pointing at a <laughs> whiteboard everywhere because th they don't really add value. Be careful with embedded and integrated elements and tend your content like don't make your website into a content dump that in two years will just annoy the heck out of you because no one can find anything and you can't find anything in the in the admin side anymore. And then thoughts for the client. The hosting, where is it going to be hosted? There are greener and less greener options out there. Also a thought, f thought that Google is not your rival because some quite often clients are like, they have this worry that uh, our website must be so bad because 
no one uses our internal search and people just come straight to these pages from Google. But really, if if I go to a web, I'm, I'm searching for a thing and I find the direct page from the Google and I find the information that I was looking for. From my point of view as a user, I was serviced really well. So it's actually not a loss if people find your stuff through Google. And there is no need to build unnecessary bulk to your website to try to sort of get around that and like in hopes of people actually using your navigation structure or your search or anything. Yeah. And also a word of warning about analytics and uh, be mindful with those also. So of course, pretty much everyone has like at least one analytic solution running around there. But especially if you start feeling like I need to have this and this and this, I want to have Google Analytics, I also want to have Matomo, I want to have Hotjar, then it will make your bet heavier and also think, are you really going to use all that data? And sorry, I'm really <laughs> running over time, but then the SEO, this is the last slide I have. Because um, cause all that what I was talking about was sort of reducing things. This might arise a worry that how is this going to affect my SEO? Because doesn't this then mean less content, less traffic? Isn't this going to be bad for my SEO? No, I don't think so. Because when your website is less energy intense, well, it's greener, but it's also faster. And search engines love when sites are fast and mobile friendly and easily accessible. And these days, search engines, they value the context over just the sheer amount of content. So they do not appre even appreciate it that you have redundant content with the same keyword all over. And when you create your content around the user journeys and mindfully, it is likely that the search engines will get a clearer picture of what, it, what your site is about and it should work in your favor. And then this argument, does it that lead to less page views? Mm. If you really aren't directly in an industry for click hoarding, for example, if you are not Iltalehti, then you do not need those pointless clicks. You do not need that volume. And you only really need those clicks that or actually lead into good engagement. Because search engines, they do not value those like pointless clicks where it's clear from the user's other behavior that they didn't find what they were looking for. They just came and they went. Search engines don't really value that. So the engagement matters more and making concise, mindful, user journey oriented content pro provides you that engagement that you are going to need. And that's just takeaways. So yeah, anything, even the digital content has a carbon footprint. Everyone that has something to do with the website can also have an effect and should do something about it. And you should think about finding a balance between the user need and the energy intensity of stuff. <laughs> yes. Thank you how much I am over time. <laughs>